Hey guys, welcome to another video in the 100 terabyte 10 gigabit home server series. If you haven't seen any of the previous videos, check out the card here or check in the description where all the other episodes will be listed. Today we're going to take a look at installing Proxmox on the server. This is going to be a bit more basic level tutorial video, but I have some more in-depth stuff planned for upcoming videos. In this video, we're going to run through downloading Proxmox and creating a USB stick with Proxmox on it. And then we're going to take a look at some BIOS settings and after that, run through the installation process together. Once that's done, we're also going to run through creating a simple RAID Z pool from 5 times 2 terabyte disks. And in the future, I'll do a more in-depth video about ZFS and some advanced ZFS mirror pools with SSD caching and stuff like that. And in the last part of the video, we do some basic setup stuff for a new Proxmox server. And to end the video, we're going to install a small Linux VM together. I'll make sure to include time jump links in the description so you can jump ahead if you, you want to skip a section. Right, so to get started, we need to download the newest version of Proxmox. Links to everything and command line commands will be put in a blog post you'll find in the description. Please check that out if you want to perform any of these steps yourself. On the download page, download the ISO file and we're going to use version 6.0. While that's downloading, we also need a tool called Balena Etcher. Once both are downloaded and Etcher is installed, you're going to need a USB stick. Anything bigger than one gigabyte should be fine. Insert the USB stick and start Etcher. Point it to the downloaded ISO file and then to the USB stick and hit write and wait. You might get some partition pop-ups as you can see on my screen, but just click cancel on those. Okay, USB stick is done. Let's go to the server and check some BIOS settings to make sure we avoid some problems in the future. In the BIOS, it's probably best to load optimized defaults and then make the following changes. First, we need to enable something that's called SVM mode. In my BIOS, that's located under advanced frequency settings and then advanced CPU core settings. There you can set SVM mode to enabled. This enables certain virtualization features inside of your CPU, which Proxmox wants to use. Then in the BIOS tab, you also want to set storage boot option control to disabled and also set other PCI device ROM priority to disabled. Now these might be called differently in your motherboard BIOS, but look for anything that sounds kind of the same. These settings disable the option ROM loading during boot. Since we won't be booting from the network or any LSI controllers, we don't need to load their BIOSes while booting. If you do want to boot from the LSI controller, you need to set the first option to legacy only. Setting it to UEFI can work, but that means you need to do certain Proxmox stuff differently and I don't recommend that right now. Okay, hit F10 to save all changes and hit F12 to get into your boot override menu. Again, this might be different on some motherboards that's F9, but in my case that's F12. There you should see your USB stick listed. Now it depends on your system if you need to select a UEFI version of your USB stick or not. In my case, I need to do so even though I disabled it earlier on. A thing of note, a mouse can actually really help during the graphical part of this installer. If you have one, make sure it's connected right now. Once booted, you should be greeted by the following screen. There, hit the first option to install Proxmox. Of course, we agree with any license agreement that's ever presented to us. Then, we get to the storage configuration for where you want to install Proxmox. Here, we're going to make a few changes, or at least if your hardware resembles anything like my server is configured. Hit Options and change EXT4 to ZFS RAID 1. It will then present a list with all the disks Proxmox detects and you want to select the SSDs or boot devices you want to create a mirror of and install Proxmox onto. Set all others to do not use. Then we want to do a little tweaking in the advanced options. Here we only change compression from on to LZ4. This shouldn't be necessary but I like to be sure. 
Then we also want to change the HD size value. These are 256 gigabyte SSDs, but I never use the full size if I can avoid it to over provision them. So in this case, I'm going to enter a value of 200 gigabytes. Hit OK and Next. Then fill in your country details. And once everything is correct, hit Next again. Set a password and enter an email address. Now this email address is important because the server will send you messages when something is wrong. Select the correct network card and make sure to fill in a correct FQDN hostname like you see here. Then also fill in all the IP details. It's best to always use a static IP for your virtual host machine. If you don't know what these values mean, that's kind of beyond this video. Uh, maybe ask in the comments or in Discord or look it up online. Once you hit next, you'll see a quick summary screen. And once you hit install, the installation starts. Okay, all done, let's reboot. Once the installation is done, Proxmox should automatically boot. If it doesn't, check your BIOS and make sure you have selected the Linux bootloader or the SSDs used during the selection process while installing Proxmox. Since we are running a mirror, make sure to select both devices so that if one fails, it will still boot from the other one. Okay, that's done. Great. Almost done with the basics, but let's configure a few more things, but now using the web interface and some remote sessions. First, we're going to make sure you can update Proxmox to the latest version. To do that, we need to enable the community repository. To do this, we log into the web interface. The address and port number for this are listed on the screen once Proxmox is booted. The first time you will get a security warning, you can safely ignore this. After we proceed, you'll see a Proxmox login prompt and there we log in with root and then the password used during the installer. Every time you log into this interface, you'll get a pop-up once that you don't have an official license. Now, there are ways to remove this pop-up, but I don't really condone that method. You can use the software without paying for it, and that's fine. And the only thing that bothers you is this pop-up. If you hate it that much, buy a license. Once in the interface, the first thing we want to do is get the latest updates. But this doesn't work out of the box. You need to reconfigure Proxmox to use the community repository. To do this, open a shell and choose Xterm. Now, this didn't work while recording, so I opened a PuTTY session instead, but it's basically the same thing. There, we're going to change the repositories available to apt. apt is the package installer for Debian, which Proxmox is based on. All these steps will also be typed out in a blog article, so you can repeat them more easily yourself. Basically, we are removing the PVE enterprise repository file, and then editing the default one to include the community version. After that, we can run a apt update to get all the latest information and install it using apt dist minus upgrade. Once that's done, give the machine a reboot and you're done. Updating will now also work from the GUI. To make sure the GUI reflects all changes, give it a refresh once the server is back up. Let's continue by configuring a simple RAID Z pool. I'll be doing videos on more complex ZFS setups and technical details and how to create more advanced pools. Make sure to stay subscribed for that. And if you haven't subscribed, maybe consider doing so. My disks have already been used. So although they show up under disks, I can configure a pool on them. Let's fix that. Although configuring a pool from the GUI is now available, I'd rather still do it from the command line. That way I have a bit more control over it, and I also like to use the slash dev slash disk slash by ID links instead of slash dev slash SDA, SDB, SDC. Using dev disk by ID links, it doesn't matter if you reshuffle the disks even between controllers or systems. They just always work. Okay. Let's first clear those disks. 
To do that, we go back to the command line and use a tool called gdisk to basically delete all partitions from the disks. These are my Samsung disks I want to use. Let's erase them. To erase, you look at which partitions exist with P and then D, both those partitions, and exit with W, as you can see I'm doing on the screen. And then, well, we repeat that for all the disks. Now, if we check in the GUI, we can see that all the disks are available. But as said, I'd rather use the command line way anyway. Again, remember, all commands will be listed in a blog post that is listed in the description, so you can follow along at your own pace. Now, I'm not going to go into detail explaining the zpool create command all too much. Just know you should basically always use the minus O, A shift is 12, and that the RZ2 terabytes or TB is the name I'm giving the pool right now, and I'm choosing a RAID Z2, which means I'm using two parity disks, so basically equivalent to RAID 6 protection. I'm using old two terabyte disks, which have been in service for over eight years, so I'd rather use RAID Z2 than RAID Z1. Better safe than sorry. Okay, ZPool created and available. Let's make sure compression is turned on for the whole pool. LZ4 compression is basically free on modern processors, so it's good to always enable it. Okay, the GUI is seeing our new pool and everything looks correct, but it's not available to use yet. You still need to add it as storage within Proxmox. You do that by adding it in the storage menu, and I enable thin provisioning because that works best if you want to host VMs on it. Okay, all done and online. Let's create a place where we can put ISO files and also make backups. And we'll put an Ubuntu VM ISO file there so we can install that. To do so, we create what's called a ZFS dataset on the command line. A dataset is a sort of mix between a partition and a directory. If you're going to create directories with a specific purpose and want to make sure that later on you can set a quota or do some other stuff with it, it's good to make a dataset. You can also make snapshots of datasets and you can't really of a single directory. Then we're going to add the dataset as our directory to Proxmox so we can upload our Linux ISO install file to it. In storage, we now add a directory, call it ISO, and point it toward the dataset on the pool. Here we say we want to house everything except disk images and containers and will allow up to 10 backups. Okay go to the newly created ISO storage and upload your favorite Linux ISO file. In my case, that's a net install version of Ubuntu 18.04 LTS. Once uploaded, we can create a new VM and I won't go through all the settings right now, but basically we're selecting the ISO image we just uploaded and I'm installing it on the SSDs for speed. Okay, once created, click on the VM, 100 in my case, and start it. Then you can click the console button to view it. And well, that's it. You now set up a Proxmox machine, made it so that we can run updates,
created some ZFS storage, and even installed your first virtual machine. Hopefully this tutorial was helpful to you. I'm quickly going to continue using my server to migrate my data from the old server to the new one. This was a bit of a basic video to get you started. More advanced and more in-depth videos coming up soon though. A like and subscribe is always appreciated. A share even more, maybe you have some friends who wants to install or try out Proxmox 2. And I hope to see you guys back next time. Bye bye.